Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound Radio Show, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I'm Robert Winfrey. I'm your host for this show. Another fair warning, this is the second week in a row I'm flying solo. Uh, this is just uh, just another scheduling thing. I'm, I'm recording this much earlier than usual because here in the United States, for those who are fans of American football, it is Super Bowl Sunday. And while I am not the biggest fan of foot, American football or soccer, uh, coincidentally, as a general course of action, there is a family tradition around it, and I consequently have to, so I go, we hang out, we eat food that's bad for us, we watch the game, it's more a social thing. But it is tradition, and I'm not going to throw it out of the, you know, I'm, yeah, so you know, again, I do that, just means I wind up recording this earlier than usual on this particular Sunday, and Jeff was unfortunately unable to uh, make the recording session, so it's just me, next week, back to normal, just a weird couple of weeks, I apologize. On the docket tonight, or whenever you happen to listen to this, it's actually just early afternoon for me. Uh, we have a review of last night's event, UFC Fight Night 144, slash UFC on ESPN Plus 2. Again, a plus one is more than enough. I don't know why anyone needs a plus two. And yeah, I'm going to keep making that joke. I know it's bad. <laughs> oh, apologies for that. I did not get to the pause button fast enough. All right. We will also have a preview of UFC 234 next week's card. Uh, it's a weak card, but has a great top two fights. You have Whitaker and Gastelum, and Robert Whitaker is just... He's not as criminally underappreciated as, say, Henry Cejudo, generally speaking, because Cejudo is vastly underappreciated for his overall talent, but uh, Whitaker just had what should have been the fight of the year... In 2017, the absolute fight of the year in 2018, but a bunch of morons. See, this is the problem with deciding these things by a popular vote, because recency bias and just general exposure play a massive role. So when I think it was, I think on the UFC's official, uh, the UFC official thing when they had the voting for that, I think um, Pettis versus Ferguson won, which was not a better fight than Whitaker Romero to, but happened closer to the end of the year and was seen by significantly more people. Uh, Whitaker Romero too headlined an event that did 200 some odd thousand buys, whereas Ferguson and Pettis were a featured bout on the Connor versus Khabib card, which was 2 million or so pay per view buys. So, again, happened sooner, seen by a lot more people. Not a better fight. But Whitaker is going to fight Kelvin Gastelum, which is a really good fight. Uh, you also have Adesa Israel Adesanya versus Anderson Silva in your co-main event. And beyond that, it's pretty weak. So I'll go over all of that. Uh, we also got... The NSAC finally got off their collective asses and did something. But in typical bureaucratic fashion, they didn't do anything helpful or correct in a lot of respects. So I'll go over... The results from their most recent hearing. And, you know, again, a few other bits of news that have come out over the week. It's been a pretty slow news week, all things considered. Uh, again, there, were the, there was, you know, the big thing from Nevada, but other than that... Uh, all right, so let us jump right in. Last night, UFC Fight Night 144... Uh, the entire event took place on ESPN+, Plus, both the prelims and the main card, at least for me here in the United States. Uh, the terrestrial broadcast for the for the main card in different places is still largely intact. Again, in Canada, it's still on, I think, TSN. I believe they're on BT Sport still in the UK, but, I could be, but that's been a bit in flux, so... I can only speak specifically to my region of the world, guys, so... For me, it was all ESPN+. Plus. Uh, I said last week this was a really good card on paper. Uh, might sneak up on a few people if you weren't up to date on all the participants necessarily. Uh, which I stand by. Uh, and it turned out to be a pretty darn good card in practice. Um, we had a... I'm not sure we had any thing that jumps out at me as, you know, uh, 
knockout or submission of the year right now necessarily. He had a pretty good contender for knockout of the year, uh, Johnny Walker. And he had some good submissions. Like, again, it was just a really solid overall card. There were some duds here and there, but thankfully they were few and far between and not all the way through the card. Uh, they just, you know, happened on occasion, which does in fact happen. Uh, we did have two instances of missed weight that I'll get to in due course when the fight, when the relevant fight comes along. Uh, one of them was by a huge amount. Uh, God, like seven pounds. Disgusting. You should never miss by that much. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose I could make a minor exception for, like, really, really, really late notice crap, but... Like, you shouldn't sign for a fight if you don't think you can make weight and missing by that much. Uh, anyway, we'll get to it. But in your main event, Marlon Marais. I love me some Marlon Marais. Uh, defeats Rafael Asuncao via guillotine choke in the first round. Uh, three minutes, 17 seconds of the first round specifically. Uh... The fight itself played out about like I kind of expect. I didn't expect a first round finish from Marais, but Marais has improved significantly in many respects from his first in, from his first fight with Austin Sal. Which, bear in mind, I still think he won. Uh, Marais moved a lot better. Uh, didn't get. He you know, wasn't there to be hit as much. He landed a few good leg kicks. That I don't. You know, they didn't hobble necessarily, Austin Sal, but got him thinking about them, uh, and then finally just kind of exiting a pocket exchange, he, not really a pocket exchange, that implies a lot more, cl they were, I forget the name for the middle distance, but, you know, they got relatively close, had a bit of an exchange, and as they're, as they separated, Marais just kind of decided, screw it, let's see if this lands, threw an overhand right, it did land, because, Austin Sao, Austin Sao's lead hand was down a little bit. I don't remember if he was doing a stance switch or if he was—he was—he might have been thinking about it because when he does switch his stance, uh, Austin Sao frequently will drop his lead hand a little bit uh, mid switch because it winds because uh, it winds up being his rear hand after the switch is completed, and it does kind of leave you vulnerable two attacks from that side as you're making the switch. It's why, you, it's why switching in open space is always a little bit dicey. But Rice cracked him with a right. It definitely got through to him, wobbled him, so he pressed forward, hit him with it again, dropped him, got on top, uh, worked worked some ground and pound. At Austin Sao went to kind of wall walk against the fence, got to a seated position, but didn't really mind his neck, so Marais grabbed it, sat back for a guillotine, but intelligently rolled all the way through into the mounted guillotine, so that even if he lost the choke, he would still have dominant position and would be able to launch offense. Uh, he actually trapped one of... Uh, he didn't have the arm trapped in the guillotine, but he did trap one of Austin Sal's arms with his legs uh, in, the, you know, in the mount just removed every possible avenue of defense from Austin Sao, who eventually had to tap. Uh, this was a huge, huge win for Marais. Not just getting the win, but getting it the way he did. That's just the second time that Austin Sao has lost ever at bantamweight. That's just, I believe, the second time he's ever been submitted in his entire career. Uh... Yeah, that's only the yeah, that's only the second time he's that's only the third time he's been finished. Ever, and only the second time he's been submitted. Uh jeez. Austin Sao has a really great career, all things considered. Cause Austin Sao, he lost a majority decision, was submitted, lost a split decision, got knocked out, moved to Bantamweight, won a bunch, lost to TJ, and then now lost to Marlon, but golly. Yeah, the only other submission loss on his resume was fighting at featherweight when he fought Uriah Faber back in 2010. And that went all the way into the third round. Uh, Marais is unquestionably 
the number one contender at bantamweight. It's not Henry Cejudo, not Garbrandt, not Dominic Cruz. It's Marlon Moraes. I mean, Moraes is, jeez, he's on this great overall run. I mean, he fought a bunch in, two th- in 2011. He went 2-2 two and two in 2011. But he's on overall, his record overall recently is... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, he's 17 and 1 in his last 18 fights. He's not only won his last four bouts, he's finished his last three in the first round. And he's beaten good guys. Again, he beat. I, again, I thought he won the Austin South fight, but officially didn't. Fair play. He beat John Dodson. I have no idea why that was a split decision. He knocks out Aljamain Sterling in a minute and seven seconds with a beautiful knee. Uh, knocks out Jimmy Rivera with one of the sweetest switch kicks you'll ever see in just 33 seconds, and now handles Austin Sow in about three minutes. Nobody has nobody has looked that good against Austin Sow in the last like five years. Longer than that, jeez. I mean. Austin Sow's a guy that it's hard to look good against, even if you beat him, which doesn't happen all that often, but... I mean, again, even TJ in their rematch, uh, won, won clearly, but wasn't a you know standout great performance or anything. Uh, he's just a guy who's really difficult to look good against. And Moraes looked good against him. That's uh, that's a big deal. That's a massive testament to what he was able to do last night. He, uh, he is the unequivocal number one contender for the Bantamweight title right now. And it's going to be frustrating and amusing to watch how the UFC decides to screw him out of that shot. Because uh, there's no... Uh, Barring some kind of injury to Cejudo, there's no way. Like, the UFC is just not going to go that direction with this. They should. We should just get TJ versus Murdice for the bantamweight title. Let Cejudo defend the flyweight title against Joseph Benavidez. If both Cejudo and TJ win those fights, which is certainly possible, then maybe if you want to revisit that, uh, you, Cejudo moving up, I could live with it. But... I, I don't want to rush it. I don't want to deny Moraes because, I mean, what more do you do? If you're Marlon Moraes, what more can you do? You just beat four guys. All of them were ranked in the top ten when you beat them. Uh, Rivera and... I know Sterling was top ten. I think both Rivera and Austin Sal were top five. There's... Not a whole lot of people left for him to beat to prove that, hey, I just... Des- I mean, first of all, he deserves the next title shot. Cruz is injured, and I love Dom, but he's been out for too long to just jump back into a title shot. Uh, Garbrandt's already lost twice in back-to-back fights when he was finished in both on both occasions. You know, again, it, it's, it's Marlon. He is the number one contender. He should be fighting for the belt next. Period. That whole uh, detour for TJ down to 125 was a massive waste of everyone's time. It potentially log jammed the log jammed the division. It's potentially going to continue log jamming it if we just if Cejudo does just move up and fight for him there because that again leaves Marais twiddling his thumbs. Well, a guy who has one win in the UFC at bantamweight fights for the belt. Just, I'm not a fan. I'm I'm not a fan of that whole scenario. But, uh, really, really good performance from Moraes. Credit to him for fighting sick. Apparently he uh, 
contracted some illness. He mentioned on the post on his post fight interview, like in the cage, that he had really really bad diarrhea. He got something, he believes, from an infected mosquito. And in that part of Brazil, this was in Fortaleza, which is very near the equator. You know, there's some gnarly stuff that uh, gets carried around by mosquitoes in that part of the world. So credit to him for fighting through that illness. Uh, credit him for winning. <laughs> while being ill, but... Uh, again, give that man his title shot. Anything else is... I, you know, I don't expect them to. I really don't. Uh, you know, somewhat credit to Marais for doing a little bit of trash talking. I'm not... I don't like trash talk personally, but I do understand its utility. And if Marais really wants to get into the title picture, he can't just... He knows he can't just come out and, oh, I beat another top five guy in the first round without really being troubled by anything he was doing. He needs to stir up a little bit of interest, and a little bit of trash talk does that. He, you know, I got a kick out of what he said, quite frankly, when he told TJ, I don't think you deserve a shot at me after, you know, you went down and got him and got finished by Cejudo like that. I might fight someone else and let you keep hunting the little guys. Uh... And I, I kind of chuckled. So, you know, I, I, again, I hope we get Marais and TJ. I hope we just get things back on track. Just get the machine working again. Because the machine doesn't necessarily... It, it needs to just work. And you do, in some cases, have to just kind of go through the grind. And that... I mean, again, Anthony Smith is about to fight for the light heavyweight title. A little bit, in theory. As of right now, it's on. It's, uh, and again, is Anthony Smith the most deserving guy? Do I think he's got much of a shot at beating John? No, but A, he could surprise us, and B, sometimes that's just the way it works. You just keep the gears turning because the architecture has value, because the motion has value. And I think we've screwed around with that entirely too much in the UFC, generally speaking, over the last few years. And it's it's shown. I think that has... I think their success and failures of various pay-per-views, uh, you know, the excitement level of various... Uh, of the fan base, it has become a lot more... I mean, it, there's always a feast or famine element to combat sports. It's been exacerbated, I feel, by the UFC's abandonment of, not abandonment, but their move away from you know, the established architecture towards the extremes, and as a result, you see, you know, the market essentially reacting in that in that same way. So you don't get a lot of just really solid, you know, 500,000 buy rate pay-per-views. You get one or two one million pluses, and then a lot of the 300,000 range. And, you know, which is better comes down to the math on individual events and how things work. And again, I, I don't have access to all the information, but I do think that a lot of, and I suppose you could argue which one came first, but I think that the path the UFC went on exacerbated it, whether it was there, whether it was pre-existing or not. Again, chicken or egg argument aside, I do just want to see them kind of get back to it because that's how the mo you get, I think that's how you get consistently at least the best fights. I want to see Marais and TJ. I think it's the best fight you can make at bantamweight for that title. All respect to Henry, who just blitzed TJ in, you know, at 125, but I want to see Marlon and TJ fight for that belt. That's what I'm interested in. I favor TJ, but Marais poses some very interesting questions of him. Marais has good leg kicks. Marais has wicked hand speed. Uh, TJ doesn't have the fastest hands in the world. Uh, you know, TJ does a lot of really great things. Again, his ambidexterity is good. His ability to blend kicks and punches is good. His striking in the pocket is very good, but I think Marais has faster hands. Uh, Marais is also a little bit more explosive, generally speaking. Uh, they both have very dynamic games, so I want to see those two fight. I'm, less int I'm more interested in that than I am... Cejudo coming up to bantamweight and fighting TJ again. I'm just, that doesn't, I'm not really interested in that. But I am just one guy. 
and the market will is, and inevitably the market essentially will dictate what happens. I'm just making my case to try and influence it. If for those of you who disagree, who are you know, I'm sure there are people who are more interested in Cejudo and TJ up at bantamweight. I disagree with you, but fair play. What you like is what you like. Um, Austin Sow came out and said he plans to just keep on trucking after the loss, and you know what? God bless him for it. Uh, Austin Sow is, a, again, a largely underappreciated fighter. Uh, in, in no small part because of his fighting style, because he's he doesn't have very engaging fights, generally speaking. But he's a remarkably consistent guy, and if he's going to just keep on trucking, he's going to keep on trucking. And that sort of perseverance is the hallmark of a fighter who has longevity in the sport. Maybe That maybe won't always get you to the title. I mean, it's a shame that Austin Sow didn't get to fight for the belt, because I would argue at various points he definitely earned it, but... Bantamweight's had some hiccups as far as that goes. But, again, just, you know, the the fortitude to just, all right, I had a setback, I had a big setback, but I plan on just keep moving forward, they'll line up another guy, and I'll fight. Uh, I applaud, I do applaud that, so. Um, Murray should, again, Murray should fight for the belt. That's it. Uh, that is the only fight he should take. Uh, he, he's the number one contender. It just case closed. Again, Cruz is injured. Garbrandt's got another... Garbrandt's fighting... Isn't he fighting John Lineker? I'm pretty sure they signed Garbrandt and Lineker. Uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I don't know why I can't remember. <coughs> Probably because it... Comes and goes. Oh, Munoz. That was it. Not Lineker. Munoz. Uh, Garbrandt and Munoz uh, are fighting. So, yeah. I mean, even if Garbrandt wins that, I just... I, that doesn't put him back in title contention against a guy who starched him twice. Uh, it's Murais. Give it to Murais. Let's have that fight play out. And it sh- it'll be an awesome fight. At least it is on paper. Um, speaking of awesome fights on paper, this one actually turned out to be pretty good in practice. Uh, Jose Aldo defeats Hanato Moicano via TKO in the second round. These two had a tentative first round, a feeling out. When I say tentative, I don't mean boring. They felt each other out for the first round, which should have been a major indicator that Moicano was not going to win this fight. Moicano is actually a very good first round fighter, generally speaking. I mean, he again, he beat Cub Swanson in the first round. Uh, he had a really good first round against Ka- uh, Calvin Cater that set the pace for the rest of the fight, uh, you know, between his check hooks and his leg kicks. He, uh, when he beat, when he lost to Brian Ortega, he still had a very good, he had some good parts in that fight. I mean, the first round was his, pretty clearly. Now, the body work from Ortega in the second slowed him down, and that led into the third and played into the finish, but... Uh, the Stevens fight, he had a good first round, just a lot of hit and move. He normally has a very good first round, so when he didn't have a very good first round against Jose Aldo, that should have been a big indicator. Uh, they traded a few leg kicks, but Moicano didn't really commit to them, and in fairness, neither did Aldo, and Aldo landed a few. Uh, Aldo had some good body work in the first, but again, both guys just kind of went, okay, let's feel each other out. Moicano had some good jabs. Uh, both these guys have a very good jab. Both men had some good defensive work. There was a lot of fake, faint, see see how the opponent reacts, the other guy moves his head. There was a lot of anticipation. In fact, uh, the final sequence of that round, of the first round was a rather amusing. Uh, one guy fakes, the other guy reacts, you know, head movement, fakes a counter, the other guy reacts. It, it looked like a weird kind of dance. Uh, but it, it kind of lets you know the headspace both guys were in. Both guys were very defensively minded in that first round. Then we get into the second, and Jose Aldo has officially had enough of this. <laughs> um, look, I know a lot of I know Aldo got a bit of a bad rap for parts of his UFC run because he his attitude rubbed some people the wrong way. Which is fine. Again, who you like and who you root for is entirely up to you. I'm not here to 
necessarily convince you otherwise. But he got kind of a bad rap, and I think a lot of fans didn't watch him uh, when he was really, I mean, again, at his best is a weird way to phrase this, but when he was actively trying to destroy his opponent rather than proving his superiority. And there's a difference there. Again, when he fought, you know, Mark Hominick or Ricardo Lamas, and, you know, the fight goes the distance, and everyone kind of looks at it like, well, dang it, Jose, why didn't, why couldn't you finish this guy? You know, there's there's a lot of risk-reward that goes into when you're the champion managing a fight, and Jose Aldo managed fights very, very well throughout his, the majority of his career, in fact. He just wasn't willing to risk a whole lot when he had so much to lose, especially when he doesn't, when he doesn't need to. It's one of the most amusing things about Aldo's title runs. Well, well, leave it to the first run. His U. Let's you know his WC into UFC run. Jose Aldo, in the majority of cases, found a level above his opponent and simply stayed there. When he beat Mark Hominick, he just found a gear that was one gear better than what Hominick was doing, and he just never ratcheted things up. And again, there were uh, contextual things for that fight in particular. You know, the illness he was suffering. Uh, that led to a really bad weight cut, you know, etc. Uh, you know, the Lamas fight, he just, okay, this is what I this is what I need to do to win. And this is how I win with the lowest possible risk to myself and by the most comfortable margin. And that's what he did. And it, I think one of the most interesting things about it was to watch fights where he got pushed to, you know, go further. The first Frankie Edgar fight, uh, the second Chad Mendez fight, where it's clear that you know he starts, he has a, he has the area where he wants to compete, and then his opponent does something to raise the game, and Jose Aldo doesn't simply remain static; he raises his game to still be better than his opponent. Uh, again, it's it's a bizarre thing because it goes so underappreciated in many respects because against a lower level of opposition, it might kind of look like he's coasting or not interested. But it's that same mentality that allows him to rise so consistently to guys who are really great. Again, guys like Mendez and Edgar. Because he did elevate himself to those fights when pushed to it. I mean, he gave Max Holloway some problems in both of their fights. Uh, In both fights, I think he took the first... Uh, sorry. In the first fight, he clearly took the first round and arguably took the second. And he had some success in their rematch, too, again, in the first round. So it, it's not like he's, you know... But, again, sorry, my point was, there's a lot of fans who only have that perception of him as champion when he's in that position, who didn't see the path of destruction he carved through, you know, WEC when he knocked guys out cold with, you know, a, he had this beautiful lean-back knee in one of his first WEC fights. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Wasn't... Might have been the, the Alexandre Noguera fight. No, no, no. That was... I remember that one. Uh, Perez? I think it was Perez. When he knocked out Polando, uh, Rolando Perez. Just hit this beautiful lean-back knee as Perez overcommitted, ducking in for a jab to the body. Uh, you know, then the flying knee that he landed on <laughs> Cub Swanson is a thing of beauty. I mean, he stopped Mike Brown in two rounds. When Mike Brown was, you know, a really good fighter. Mike Brown's uh, another largely underappreciated guy nowadays. Uh, Jose Aldo dismantled him in the first and finished him in the second. I mean, this, in the, again, this was a guy who would, you know, wreck people. <laughs> And he's not champion anymore and seems to have gotten a little bit of that back. Uh, you know, between not stopping Jeremy Stevens and then now stopping Moicano. Uh, somebody posted something interesting. Jose Aldo has never had a three-round fight go to a decision. <laughs> had a lot of five-rounders go the distance. But he's only lost one non-title fight in his entire career. Uh, that was much earlier in his career, back in 2005. 
And that was actually up at lightweight. Wait, he went undefeated at featherweight up until he fought Connor? That's absurd. That's genuinely absurd if that's if I if I'm not missing information on that. I was not aware of that. That's nuts. <coughs> but so again, he turned on a little bit of that savage in the second round. Um Moicano tried to throw a knee. I don't know whether he thought Aldo was going to duck for a jab to the body or I don't know exactly what he was worried about or he might have been trying to check a leg kick. But he found himself on one leg, and Aldo took a bit of an angle and then clobbered him with a left hook. It clearly rattled him, and then once he was rattled, Jose swarmed him with just body shots and a knee strike and punches and just never let him off the hook. He then proceeded to jump the cage, jump out into the crowd and celebrate. Uh, again, if you've watched Jose Aldo as long as, you know, a lot of fans have, myself included. I don't want to just say me, but there's a lot of us who have watched this guy for a lot of years, and have seen his success, have seen his short, have seen his when he's fallen. This is a heartwarming type of scenario, you know. It's it's quasi nostalgic because Aldo's mentioned that you know the end is near for his career, and God bless him for all he's given to the sport. Uh, this. Again, so there's a bit of, you know, even, you know, my cold, dead heart necessarily warms a little bit to see, you know, the old Jose Aldo show his face again for a little bit after he hurt Moicano like that. Uh, That said, pretty major setback for Moicano. This was a big step up in opportunity for him. And Moicano's still a rising guy with a very interesting all-around style. Um, In fact, Jack Slack posted a really nice breakdown of Moicano's overall abilities ahead of this fight that I'd encourage you all to look up if you haven't already, if you haven't read it already. But, uh, you know, he needs, he's, uh, this was a, you know, a loss like this is never good. Um, he looked, uh, Henry Cejudo brought this up on the post-fight press, po- not conference, but he was on a bit of the analyst desk for some of the post-fight stuff, and I caught a little bit of this. One of Henry's coaches apparently looked at Moicano throughout the first round and said he's fighting like he's starstruck. And I think there might be something to that. You know, Moicano didn't have the same first round that he usually does. Um, One of Moicano's best attributes is very similar to Max Holloway's in that he has not only a high pace, but consistently asks questions of you that you must answer and then finds a weakness to exploit. And he didn't really do a lot of that in the first round of this fight. And again, some of it might have been, you know, fighting a legend like Aldo. Um... That's the biggest name that Moicano has fought. When he fought Ortega, they were both just up-and-comers. You know, very talented up-and-comers, but... Uh, this was far and away the biggest name he's fought. I mean, he's beaten some other relevant names. You know, guys like uh, Cub Swanson and Jeremy Stevens are not nobodies. But they're not Jose Aldo, either. And... That can be something, especially if you have, not just, not, not only are you fighting a legend, but a legend that you kind of look up to. And I think he had mentioned that he was very respectful of Jose Aldo, and that's, you know, it's good to have that, but you got to kind of leave that at the door when you walk into the cage, otherwise it impacts you. And I think it did here a little bit. I mean, I still think Moicano has a very, very bright future ahead of him. Uh, he's still a young guy. Twenty nine, so not the youngest, but he's again he's overall still. I mean, his only losses are to Ortega and Aldo. You know, it's there's not a lot of shame in that. Uh, hopefully, he can rebound and keep moving forward. Um, Aldo's in a really odd position now because again he's mentioned that he thinks this is his last year fighting. He wants to have this was one of the last three fights on his UFC deal. He wants to have all of them in Brazil and then just kind of be done. Um, So I don't know who you match him up with. Because you don't want his... So again, he's now now beaten a top contender in Hanato Moicano. And fine, you know, I'm not complaining about that. But if he's genuinely only got two more fights, if that's genuinely it... 
do you really want to match him up with two more rising contenders? Guys like, say, Alexander Volkanovsky, who mentioned that he was willing to fight Aldo. And, you know, God bless you for doing so, buddy. But if Aldo wins that fight, he has beaten two rising prospects slash contenders. Both guys are contenders now, excuse me. They're not prospects anymore. He has now beaten two very promising contenders coming up in the division, and you're not really going to put him back in the title picture for his last fight, especially against a guy he who beat him twice decisively. So do you really want to match him up with guys who you want to have momentum in the title picture in 2020? Uh, Brian Ortega intimated he might be interested in uh, a fight with Aldo. I'd be interested in that fight. Um, because all mostly because Ortega just lost you know, his title fight, and so if he loses again to Aldo, it's still not good for a guy that you, again, want to be a fixture at the top of the division, but he's also not someone who is necessarily going to be immediately back in the title picture absent, you know, the Aldo fight. If he beats Jose Aldo, if he ends Aldo his first non-title loss at featherweight, his first three-round his first loss in a three-round fight in 2019, over a decade. Now, that's a big deal, and that would give him some momentum. At the same time, you know, the loss, while not good, is not going to derail you know plans for him to potentially be in the title picture in a year because he just lost fairly badly to Max. So, that would make some sense to me. Uh... Yeah, there's a lot of different guys. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's not a lot of different guys that you could really just kind of toss him in the mix with because, again, it, if you assume that Joe Zaldo is telling the truth about when he's going to be done, you know, you don't want him just knocking off contenders left and right. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see because this was, this was a big win for Aldo. Uh, I, I do hope one of those is the re- one of those last fights. I do hope I mentioned this before is the rematch between Aldo and uh, Swanson because if Aldo just comes out and double knees him again, it would be the best thing ever. But I don't think that's what would happen. Uh, as for Moicano, I think you have to match him. You do kind of have to match him down a little bit after this. But there's a lot of guys. You know, Featherweight's a solid division right now. There's a lot of guys he can still fight, and a lot of guys I favor him to beat still. Uh, Damian Maya defeated Lyman Good via standing rear naked choke in the first round. This was your typical Maya performance. Uh, he backed Good near the fence, shot a single leg, had to work for it, hit this little... He does this just kind of like, I don't want to say fully half-assed trip, but it's not the best trip you'll ever see. But he does, He you know, he shows the trip, and he either trips you down and then can start working... Or you defend the trip, and he has this really beautiful just back take that he does off of it that very few people seem to really have an answer for when he gets to that position. Uh, once he had the back, you know, good stood up, so it was in the backpack position, but Damian Maya on your back is just an absolute nightmare, and good had some pretty decent hand fighting, and he fought as long as he could, but eventually Maya just got around the neck, got the squeeze, that's all she wrote. Um... Yeah, again, this is your typical Damian Maya performance. Dude's 41 years old out there choking out guys like Lyman Good, who are, you know, freaks of... who are you know, Good's a very good fighter and a physical specimen. I mean, that man is jacked. Probably juiced a little bit, too, but... And there's Damian Maya, 41 years old, <laughs> still able to school some of the new guys, so... I mean, Maya is definitively out of the title picture, but... You know, broke a three-fight losing streak, got a much-needed win, so, you know, kudos. Uh, Charles Oliveira defeated David Tamer via Anaconda Choke in the second round. I love me an Anaconda Choke. Um, This was one of the fights I was looking forward to in this event, and it when it delivered, it delivered, but there was a lot of weirdness in this fight. Um, David Tamer accidentally, but still did poke Charles Oliveira in the eye like the opening seconds of the first round, got a point deducted for it. It was a pretty nasty one. 
So there was a and there was a bit more of that. Uh, you know, both guys. I don't want to say fight dirty, but they both have a penchant for kind of weirdness circulating in their fights. But when they actually fought, they fought very well. Uh, Tamer with some pretty good, you know, check hooks, uh, some good leg kicks. Uh, Oliveira with straighter punches than he normally throws, and then in the second. Oliveira hit this really, really nice uh, step through into an upward elbow. Uh, the you know, the Anderson Silva Tony Frickland elbow. That is a again, it's a beautiful strike that a lot of people seem to be finding ways to employ, apart from just setting a trap with your hand motion. Um, Brian Ortega throws it off of his shoulder roll, and his shoulder roll is not great. But the basic premise behind the you know the boxing shoulder roll, you keep the lead hand low, but the shoulder high, you tuck your chin behind it, and you can just kind of roll away from a punch. It'll glance off your shoulder. Uh, that same basic position does leave you in, in a great spot to throw the upward elbow, and he tried that against Max Holloway a few times in their fight, and Max at one point very nearly ran into it. He had to put the brakes on to avoid it. Uh, in this case... Oliveira just starts in the orthodox stance. He steps through into the southpaw stance, closing distance, like he's going to throw a couple of body shots. Uh, but instead, just throws the upward elbow. He's got so he, as he steps through, he's got both his hands low again, like your Max Holloway does this a lot. Just you know, starts in one stance, steps forward into the other stance, and as he's doing so, swings a couple of hooks to the body that just make your life miserable. Oliveira just steps through, throws the upward elbow, wobbles him with it, uh, starts throwing punches to, you know, goes to swarm on him. Tamer, as he's trying to defend, winds up leaving his neck exposed. Oliveira hits, uh, he just wraps it up immediately, goes into the anaconda, uh, you know, rolls through, drops down, gets the tap. Uh, beautiful choke. Very beautiful choke. Um, Oliveira seems to have finally found his stride a little bit. He thank, thankfully... He did not say, please let me go back to featherweight. I thank God. I would have lost my mind if he had done that again, because I am so sick of that guy who missed weight four times in when, during his featherweight run, saying, please let me, up to, let me go back to featherweight. I know I can be champion there. No, shut up. You can't make weight. His last featherweight fight, he officially weighed 155 pounds for. It was ridiculous. So thankfully, he seems to have stopped that. Um, he called someone out. No, sorry, sorry. He wanted. He said the Miami card. He had a card that he wanted to fight on, but didn't have a specific opponent. Um, he wanted to fight in Miami. Is there, a, there is a Miami card coming up. Um, ES, UFC on ESPN 3, April 27th, is set for Miami. Uh, cool. You know, he's he's nearly a ranked contender. He's nearly ranked at this point, so I think you should give him... Do you actually give him a ranked guy? Because, you know, lightweight is lightweight. Yeah, yeah, you give him number 15. You get, I would love Oliveira and Dan Hooker. Charles Oliveira and Dan Hooker, or Francisco Trinaldo. Yeah. I kind of like that, actually. Yeah, give me Dan Hooker and Charles Oliveira. I would be very interested in that fight. Um, so, you know, good for him. He continues to rack up submissions. Oh, sorry, I meant to mention this about Damian Maya. Um, this was Maya's 20th win in the UFC. That brings him into a three-way tie for second most wins all time in the UFC. He is tied with Bisbing and George St. Pierre. He's also the first Brazilian to get to 20 wins in the UFC. Uh, which is crazy, considering, you know, guys like Vitor Belfort or Anderson Silva. Belfort for his longevity, Silva for his insane run. Now, the first Brazilian to get to 20 wins is Damian Maia. You know, good for you, man. So, uh, Oliveira also now has, is in the conversation for longest active finish, finishing streak, because this was, I believe, three in a row for him. Uh, four in a row. Yeah, Guida, Yagos, Miller, Tamer, four in a row. He is still behind... Everyone in the UFC is behind Gregor Gillespie at, I believe, five. But, 
again, Oliveira seems to have finally found himself after, you know, bouncing around, suffering key losses, wasting everyone's time at featherweight for so long. So, and good for him because he's a genuinely great fighter. <coughs> uh, Johnny Walker scored a 15-second knockout over Justin Ledette. <laughs> this was the oddest thing I've ever seen. No, it's not. Sorry. I, I take that back. This was odd. This was a very odd thing. Johnny Walker, who's a huge guy, dude's like 6'6", six, six, uh, hits kind of a, I hate to say a step-through sidekick, but he's it's a sidekick off of the rear leg to the body of Ledette, lands in the opposite stance, so he starts orthodox, throws a sidekick coming through with the right leg, lands southpaw, throws a hook kick off the lead leg that kind of lands, then throws a spinning back fist that absolutely knocks Justin Ledette loopy. Uh, he tries an illegal kick. Uh, well, sorry. I don't want to say he tries an illegal kick. Johnny then threw a kick that, if it had landed to the head of Walker, would have been blatantly illegal and probably been a disqualification. It did not land to the head. In fact, I don't think it landed at all. Uh, if anything, it kind of grazed the shoulder or the lat area. But that said, that is an impetus that he needs to curtail in the future, because, or an impulse. Because if you... There are guys who, you know, might see that coming, even wobbled, and kind of lean into it to maybe avoid getting the loss. Or, you know, just bad luck. I mean, you just don't want to have your you know, a, a big career win derailed by you being stupid like that. So, thankfully it didn't happen. He just kind of got on top and pounded him out on the ground. Um... I, I'm real hesitant about declaring guys to watch at light heavyweight because the division is such a barren wasteland, but this is two fights for Johnny, this is two first-round knockouts, and I think... And he's a goofy guy. You know, he's got a real goofy charisma about him. Uh, did the worm after his win. <laughs> Bringing back the worm from my childhood. God help us all. So I definitely think he's someone to... you know. Pay attention to a little bit. You know, I'm not declaring him a future contender or a champion, but light heavyweight needs people that are interesting, that have, you know, upside to them, and he definitely meets those qualifications. Olivia uh, Hanata Souza defeated Sarah Froda via split decision. This fight not only sucked, uh, uh, Sarah Froda was the one who missed weight so badly. This was supposed to be a straw weight fight which is 115 pounds. 116 for non-title. They'll give you that extra pound for non-title fights. Sarah Frota weighed in at a whopping 123 pounds. Seven pounds over the limit. That's ridiculous. I'm not sure how that woman ever made straw weight to begin with. When they got next to each other, Frota's a, Frota was significantly larger. And you know, Sosa's uh, about the average straw weight, I think. And Frodo was just, you know, towering over her. Uh, again, the fight sucked. Uh, I think I believe I agreed with Sosa winning. Um, just the size disparity played a played a significant role in Sosa's inability to really do a whole lot. And both of them pulled guard at various points. This was just not a very good fight. Um, on the prelims, Marcus Perez defeated Anthony Hernandez with an anaconda choke. This is listed as a technical submission, but he does, in fact, tap with his fingers right at the very end, like, as he goes out, so it is a straight submission rather than technical. Um, not a bad fight. Nothing to stand out, nothing, you know, outstanding here, but Perez has a really good ability to catch you from the front headlock position, and uh, he hurt Hernandez with a really nice body kick. Uh, Perez is not a very dynamic guy, but he's got a pretty solid left kick to the body. He caught Hernandez with it. Uh, then while he was hurt, locked up the anaconda. Uh, solid stuff. Mara Romero Barella defeated uh, Talia Santos via split decision. 29-28, uh, you know, two for her, one for her opponent. This fight sucked. This was not good. Uh, Tiago Alves defeated Max Griffin by split decision. I disagreed with this. Um, Griffin had a really great first round. He was jabbing up Tiago Santos. He dropped him a couple of times. Uh, then Alves in the second round starts closing distance appropriately. 
Um, there was a couple of great firefight sequences between those two in the second round. That was a great second round. Uh, then in the third, this is where the issue comes, because, again, pretty clearly round a piece going into the third. Uh, in the first few seconds or so, Alves has some success striking, but they wind up clinched. Um, Griffin gets... Uh, he didn't do a whole lot with the takedowns, but he did establish great positions. I mean, he had Alves mounted for a stretch of time. And to me, if you're going to overcome the scoring deficit that is giving up mount for a protracted period of time, you have to do more than have moderate success on the feet for a brief period of time. Uh, apparently the judges didn't see it that way. Uh, good fight. All things considered. Um, this was Alves' first win in Brazil in like 13 years, 16 years. Huge amount of time. Um, but he's a native of Fortaleza, so, you know, got the hometown win, which might have played into the scoring. Not saying one way or the other. <coughs> but a solid fight. I was kind of surprised it didn't get fight of the night, although the third round just did kind of drag down the overall fight. But um, Yarzino Rosenstreich, uh, the first Surinamese fighter in the UFC, knocked out Junior Albini in the second round. Um, this was a great finishing sequence from Rosenstreich. Uh, he landed a bit of a... Let me think, he was orthodox. It was a bit of a 3-2. It was like a left hook into a straight right. Um, or a 3-4, I can't remember. If, I don't know how you would want to qualify the right that he landed as a hook or a straight. It definitely had some arc to it, so... Okay, in that case, it's a 3-5. Because it was a bit of a left hook into a right that off-balanced Albini. And then as Albini was starting to go down... I might be misremembering. Hang on. I genuinely have this... I, I, I have the video here. Hang on, let me... See if I'm remembering this properly. Uh, yeah, it's a left, yeah, left hook, right hook into the left high kick. Okay, so yeah, three, four, high kick. I forget the no, I forget how you want to numerically assign the left high kick or not. But yeah, he lands. So again, he lands the left hook, lands the right hook. The right hook is much better. And then as Albini is kind of falling, he kicks him in the head with this really nice left to the face. Um, and Albini just turtles up after that. I don't want to say anything, you know, too exciting about Rosenstrike because his ground game kind of sucks. He got taken down with relative ease in the first. Didn't have a lot off of his back. Uh, didn't really have good stand-ups even. Uh, not a lot of good frame building. One of the important things about uh, jiu-jitsu generally is when you talk about building a frame, it sounds weird, but it just is in reference to how your body is structured so that you can not just be pushed over. So it's not just muscle on muscle. There is structural support based on your body. And again, it's one of the fundamental tenets is you know, proper framing. And he didn't really have that. So there's still a lot of work to be done with this guy, but it's heavyweight. And he scored an impressive knockout, so I'm, I am sure we'll see more of him. This is Junior Albini's third loss in a row. Uh, time to cut bait with that guy. Again, he looked really good in his debut. Didn't do anything against Arlovsky. Didn't prepare properly for Ulyanik. Didn't fight very well here. Let the guy go. He's not UFC material at this point. Or if they keep him around to all the fans, let's, let's not get on the Albini hype train. It's that that that's just not a thing. Um, Geraldo de Friatas defeated Felipe Colares via unanimous decision. Um, de Friatas should have finished this fight in the third round, but there was some baffling decision making on his part in that he would hurt Colares standing, and then end his combination with a double leg. It felt more like just a rote combination that he had memorized. Okay, we're gonna go. You know, hook, straight, leg kick, double leg. And, you know, or some derivation thereof. 
And he just did that constantly. Even though, hey, the striking combination hurt this guy, I should leave him on the feet and just try to finish him here. He still duck in for the double leg. Uh, bizarre decision making. Uh, he still won, but not a good sign. You should have the fight IQ to just, okay, this guy's hurt. And more than once. I mean, again, if this was just a one-time thing, like, okay, even the best occasionally misjudge things like that. But he did it consistently. And that's, again, that's troubling to me. Um, Saeed Nurmagomedov defeated Ricardo Hamos via TKO in the first round. Hit a beautiful spinning back kick to the body. That just folded Hamos like a lawn chair. And then he pounded him out. Um, you know, the key to a good spinning back kick is timing and placement. You have to time it right. I mean, ideally, and this is some real... There's some of this that's almost impossible to predict, but if you can catch someone while they're breathing in, that's the best. But you want to time it so that, you know, they're in the place you want them to be. And then again, placement of the kick so that you're not kicking, you know, high on the chest or even kind of too low on the into the abdomen. There's a bunch of places that just, if you get hit, it, you know, it's not pleasant, but it's just kind of like, all right, you got me. And he landed two of these, uh, the one earlier in the, in the round uh, was a bit higher, kind of up into the rib cage, and it drove, it, you know, the force of it pushed Hamos most of the way across the cage, but he didn't seem adversely affected. The second one was lower, uh, you know, the heel of Nubaga Madoff uh, drove kind of into the solar plex area and then just slid down through the floating ribs and the liver, and that is, you know, that's the money spot right there. Uh, just badly hurt him immediately. Uh, good stuff from Saeed Nurmagomedov, who is not related to Khabib. I was uh, I was mistaken about that last week, so my apologies. But, you know, good stuff. He moved up to bantamweight for this because, you know, the UFC's cutting flyweight, so... Uh, good from him. And then, kicking off the whole thing, we had Rogerio Bontarin defeating Magomed Bibluada via split decision. Uh, fine with the split. Pretty good fight, actually. Uh, Bibluadov missed weight. He weighed 127. Uh, so, you know, the loss combined with, you know, the fact that this is a two-fight losing streak and missing weight and the division going away, we're probably going to lose Bibluadov in the UFC. But, again, a really good all-around fight. Both guys, good kicking diversity. Uh, just, you know, good grappling from both guys and good sweep attempts. Uh, you know, just kind of what what you like about flyweight if you like about if you like the division. This fight kind of exemplifies that. So, uh, good. And again, top to bottom, a pretty good card. Again, there were some duds. Uh, the two women, the two women's fights were just not all that good. And then uh, again, the Defriatas and Kolaris was not a great fight. But Set on paper, this was a really sneakily good card top to bottom, and it tended to deliver that, so I had a lot of fun with it, and that's something I don't get to say a whole lot anymore, but, uh, you know, thankfully, <laughs> uh, this one was, and, uh, you know, so credit to that. Thank you to everyone who stopped by and read my coverage, be that live or the full report that is currently in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. Uh, leave a comment if you're so inclined. If not, just, you know, the click. I always appreciate that. So thank you all very much. Let's see. Next, we should have... Ah, uh, yes, UFC 234. This is going to be a somewhat truncated preview because I just don't want... There's just not a whole lot here. Uh, past the top two fights, so. But that being said, let's go ahead and give it the old college try. Uh, your main event, uh, the UFC is in Melbourne? Yes, they are in Melbourne for this. Uh, Robert Whitaker and Kelvin Gastelum. Whitaker trying for his first actual title defense. Oh, poor Whitaker, man. Best middleweight in the world. And yet, you know, uh, it's just so weird that he's... 
in the position that he's in because he's on this big winning streak. He's definitively beaten the other best middleweights in the world. I mean, you know, knocked out Derek Brunson, knocked out Jacare, beat Romero pretty convincingly the first time, beat him the second time. Again, I, I think at a minimum that fight should be a draw. But two great fights. Yet he received the title by being promoted to it from interim champion after George St. Pierre retired again for health reasons, after he won the belt from Bisbing. And then what was supposed to be his first title defense became a non-title affair when Romero missed weight by two-tenths of a pound. Um, or a fifth of a pound. So he's trying for his first actual title defense here, and bear in mind this is also not a given because he's fighting Kelvin Gastelum. And while Gastelum has never missed weight at middleweight, I wouldn't put it past him. Um, the fight itself has some very interesting points that it breaks down along. Kelvin Gastelum is not the best striker in the world, but he has good power. And he does a lot of just one-twos. And I don't mean that as a negative. One of the most difficult things to do is something very simple, but do it as near to perfect as possible uh, every single time. And Kelvin Gastelum's 1-2, while predictable in the sense that this is basically what he does, is fundamentally sound and incredibly consistent. And those two things will carry you a long way in any combat sport. Just have a couple of things that, even again, even if they're somewhat fundamentally basic, if you can execute them to near perfection every time, you will have a massive amount of success. I mean, again, even you know something like amateur wrestling. Uh, you know, Kale Sanderson, Olympic gold medalist, current head coach at Penn State. Uh, I think one of the only, if not the only, undefeated Division One collegiate wrestlers. He, because his entire collegiate wrestling career, he went undefeated. Uh, he, he, well, again, great, great wrestler. One of the things that led to his such consistent success was his mastery of the old kind of John Smith low single leg. And when I say a low single leg, uh, it's a real low single leg. You you wind up, uh, you want to get like one hand around the back of your opponent's heel. Get your forearm all the way on the mat so that they can't turn their leg out and then you drive your shoulder into their shin. Uh, it's it's a very effective you know takedown when you can use it properly. And Sanderson had that particular technique down to a, you know, a, a science, basically. And it led to a lot of his success. And again, this is a, you know, the basics of that technique are taught to everyone. It's not like some great secret. It's, you know, it's not as rudimentary as, you know, a blast double or a high crotch, but it's, it's one of those things that everyone is taught. He just did it so well that even, you know, the best wrestlers of his generation, even internationally, couldn't really deal with it. I mean, again, the guy was at least a one-time gold medalist. Um, in fact, I think Daniel Cormier talked about it because he and Sanderson were on the same international team, that one of the reasons Yoel Romero would have success against him was just his freak athleticism. When he'd go for that, uh, Romero was able to just kind of leap with one leg over him. And it, it just, you know, changed the complexion of the whole thing. And it, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to be someone like Yoel Romero to pull it off. But it's... But it's... It, it can be done. It's really hard. And that kind of, you know, dedication to just the fundamental consistency is what is a lot of Kelvin Gastelum's success. Gastelum's a good wrestler. But if you look at what he's done lately, a lot of it has just been... Marching forward, consistent one-twos, consistent pressure, backed up by his power, 
And he, again, he's added a few wrinkles. I think he showed some good leg kicks against Jacare. I think I scored that fight for Souza. I'm genuinely curious as to how I did that now. Uh, it was UFC 224. Uh, anyway, but the point being, he's there's nothing fancy about Kelvin Gastelum's game. There's just a lot of consistency that you have to deal with every time <laughs> that you are fighting him, and that's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, on the other hand, you have Robert Whitaker, again, the best middleweight in the world, Frankly, I wouldn't be shocked if Whitaker winds up as the best middleweight of all time. And I know it's... Okay, no, I did score it for Gastelum, okay. But yeah, the third round was a bit of a swing round, so... Okay, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> uh yeah, okay, so Whitaker, I think, might wind up surpassing Anderson Silva. Now, I don't think he'll surpass Anderson Silva's record, but there's more to, you know, there's more to it than just how many title fights did you win. That's certainly a component, but I think Whitaker could surpass him. I mean, look, Max Holloway, in many respects, has surpassed Jose Aldo as the best featherweight ever, and Max Holloway has a grand total of two title defenses. Jose Aldo between his WEC and UFC run, uh, titles, if you, you know, count it continually from his WEC win over Mike Brown to the loss to Connor, had like a 15-fight winning, like winning streak if you count all of his WEC fights. Something like nine title defenses consecutively. I mean, absurd number. Max has two, but in many respects has surpassed Aldo. And I think Whitaker might wind up doing the same to Anderson, despite not necessarily having the same numerical accomplishments in some respects. Um, again, I see Gastelum walking forward, and Whitaker can be hit, and you know Gastelum hits pretty hard, but Whitaker's, if he uses the low-line sidekick, and he probably will because Gastelum is a southpaw, I mean, it, it was so fascinating rewatching Whitaker Romero too, because Romero fights that whole thing basically orthodox after fighting the majority of his career southpaw. And how Whitaker's game plan of a lot of sidekicks to the knee to kind of just stop his forward motion and whatnot, it actually led to him being in trouble in the third round because the the sidekick to the knee or the thigh, when you're against an opposite stance opponent, using your lead leg is the best way because their leg is right there. It's a, it's a straight line. If you're fighting someone in the same stance as you, so orthodox to orthodox, both of your left legs are forward, and you have to kick then across your own body and across your opponent, and it creates opportunities for them to either parry the kick or just kind of deflect it and then take a superior angle to your relative to your body position and hit you from there. And again, that's kind of what led to... It was a front kick that uh, Whitaker had thrown, but if memory serves from the second Romero fight. But the general principle is still the same. The fact that you are fighting someone in a, you know, a closed stance versus an open stance does fundamentally alter some of the tools that you utilize. And given that Gastelum fights Southpaw and Whitaker Orthodox, that lead leg sidekick to the knee as Whitaker, as Gastelum is coming forward could be a very, very significant weapon for Whitaker. Um, also, you know, Whitaker has one of the best jabs in MMA, and Gastelum throws a lot of one-twos, but he's not a very jab-heavy fighter. Uh, whereas Whitaker will just jab for the sake of the jab, and then build off of it as time goes on, but if he, throw, if he throws a jab, he can just throw a jab. Most of Gastelum's jabs are always jab followed by cross, so it's always one, two. Not necessarily one reset, one you know, doubling up on the jab. And again, I'm not complaining about a guy who's, you know, as remarkably consistent with the fundamentals as Gastelum is, but this is something Whitaker can build off of and get a read on. And again, the jab against the opposite stance fighter is always a bit of a tricky thing anyway, because it's so reliant on your foot position to not have opened up a punching lane for the other guy. Uh, Whitaker's a much more active kicker than Gastelum is. I don't know how that will play into this, 
But it very well, it could very easily do so because if, you know, Gaslam overcommits marching on a 1-2 and doesn't bring his hands back properly, he's vulnerable then, especially his le- especially his power hand, because Gaslam can tend to let that come back instead of in a straight line back into proper position. We'll kind of arc it down more towards his chest, leaving himself exposed, and if Whitaker can, you know, sneak a head kick in off of one of those, uh, that could be a lot of trouble for Gaslam. <laughs> Um, this is Gastelum's first five-round fight, I believe. And while his gas tank is pretty, has been very, very solid over three-round fights, uh, I don't. So again, I don't expect him to just gas out if this goes into four and five. But it is something to pay attention to because there's just no data on it. Um, I like Whitaker to win the fight. Again, I think he's got a few more tools. I think as long as he doesn't get sloppy with them, he should win. Uh, I think Whitaker, again, I just like Whitaker generally, so I, I've got him to win this fight, but I, I think you sleep on Kelvin Gastelum at your own peril. Um, in the co-main event, we have Israel Adesanya versus Anderson Silva. This is a potentially interesting fight. The UFC is pretty clearly setting this up as the passing of the torch moment. Because Adesanya is, in some respects, the next kind of iteration of the spectacular nature of Anderson Silva's fighting. How many wins does Anderson have overall? He's 13 at middleweight. I'm just curious about this now because I am, so... He had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. He has 17, so he only has he has 17 wins in the UFC. Um, Silva just coming up, just broke that losing streak with a decision over Derek Brunson that I don't even think he deserved to win. <coughs> um, yeah, I I can't pick I can't pick against Adesanya here. Um, Adesanya had maybe the best 2018 of anyone in the sport. He certainly had the breakout year of all people in 2018. Um, again, it's arguable between him and Daniel Cormier if you wanted to break down, you know, who was the fighter of the year. Breakout of the year for Adesanya, unequivocally. Uh, dude fought four times in the UFC against increasing levels of opposition, won all four of them, in pretty decisive fashion. And his last thing was uh, he just you know, smoked Derek Brunson. And Derek Brunson, while beatable, uh, beating him like that is still a pretty big mar- feather in your cap. Um, I can't possibly predict what these two are going to do. They're both fundamentally like unpredictable in terms of motion strategy, the crazy stuff they each pull out. But I can't pick against Adesanya here. Anderson has slowed down considerably. He hasn't looked all that good recently. Um, I got Adesanya here. All right, beyond that, this whole card kind of falls down a little bit of a cliff. Um, so, so you've been warned. Um, Ronnie Yaya, one of the more underappreciated guys. Um... This is a guy, Yaya's a guy with a lot of wins in the UFC. Had a good WEC run. I mean, yeah, he has like two losses in the UFC. Sorry, three. Ronnie Yaya has lost just once at bantamweight. At featherweight in the UFC, he lost to Chad Mendez. And then he lost a very close split decision to Tom Nienamaki. Uh, that very easily could have gone his way, if I'm remembering the fight correctly. I mean, dude is 6, 7, excuse me, 7 and 1 in his last 8 fights. On another 3-fight winning streak, he's finished all 3 of them. Uh, one Kimura, one arm triangle, one heel hook. That was a really sweet heel hook he hit on Luke Sanders, by the way. I mean, this uh, Yaya just is a guy with who you know, gets no respect. <laughs> He is the Rodney Dangerfield of the bantamweight division. I don't even think he's ranked at the moment. Okay, you know he's ranked. He is number 15. 
This is ridiculous. First of all, Peter Yan should be higher. Almeida and Perez should be lower, yet poor Yaya, man. Just no respect. No respect at all for that guy. Um, he is fighting Ricky Simone. Um, is Simone a replacement? He is not. Uh, I can't pick against Yaya here against, uh, Simone's fought a couple of times in the UFC, but, I mean, Ronnie Yaya is a model of consistency. And unless Simone is, has been hiding how good he is, I expect Yaya to beat him. Via submission, probably in the first round. Um, Montana De La Rosa will fight Nadia Kasim. Kasim? She's from Australia, so that could actually have a few different in- correct pronunciations. Uh, Kasim defeated Alex Chambers. She missed weight when doing so, though. Jeez. She weighed 120. So she's at flyweight here, okay. Uh, I mean, Montana De La Rosa is actually pretty good. Um, this one has some potential, but I think it'll be De La Rosa. Um, Sam Alvey is stepping in on short notice to fight Jimmy Crute, so this fight will suck. Uh, because Sam Alvey. If Sam Alvey doesn't just knock you out, um, his fights are just so bad. Sam Alvey got stopped by Little Nog in his last fight. <laughs> oh, God, that was Nog's... Again, this is Little Nog. Oh, God, yeah, he, like... His Little Nog, yeah, he finished him. He lost to Bader. He stopped Patrick Cummins. God. Yeah, that, that's... God, I, lo- I have a lot of respect for Little Nog. Uh, Rogerio Noguera, but... You get finished by him in 2018, man. That is not <laughs> that is not a very good statement about your current skill sets. Uh that said, I I think he'll probably win this. His opponents fought maybe once in the UFC. Um I think he's fought it maybe twice. But I expect Sam Alvey to win. It'll probably be a crappy decision unless his opponent just walks onto a counter left. Um on ESPN, we do have ESPN prelims here. Uh, Devante Smith will fight Dong Hyun Ma. Um, for the record, this is... This is actually Dong Hyun Kim, but not stun gun Dong Hyun Kim. Uh, Maestro Dong Hyun Kim. He changed his ring name to Dong Hyun Ma, so as to avoid confusion. Um, fair enough. Uh... Ma's on a three-fight winning streak, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at. And he's... <sighs> Devontae Smith, I believe, has fought in the UFC before. Or is this guy making his debut? <coughs> I believe he's fought in the UFC before. Yeah, yeah, he beat Julian Arosa. I knew he sounded familiar. Wait, is he... He beat Julian Arosa, and now he's... down at lightweight? I can swear Arosa's a middleweight. I have to confirm this. Unless I'm confusing Arosa with someone else. I need a picture. I am confusing a roaster with someone else. Okay. Confusing him with... Probably Julian Marquez. Guy whose nickname is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Which is Marquez something or other. Yeah, last name of Marquez. Okay. Um, I kind of like Smith here, but... Uh, you, Ma's very rarely in a boring fight, so... There's at least that going for it. Uh, Shane Young will fight Austin Arnett. Austin Arnett is terrible. Um, he barely squeaked by a decision win over Umberto Bondane, who should not be in the UFC to begin with. Uh, Shane Young. <coughs> Sorry, I apologize for the coughing, guys. I'm still getting over that cold from last week. 
Um, it's so again, my apologies for that. Young beat Rolando D. Lost to Volkanovski. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pick Shane Young. He's actually earned a win in the UFC. I mean, it was Rolando D. Though. Okay, the loser of this fight needs to not be in the UFC. Let me be clear about that. I don't think either of them should be. But I'll go with Young. Um, Kai Kara France uh, at, at Flyweight. Kai Kara France will fight um, Rulian Paiva. Where's this guy from? Oh, he's from Brazil, so it would be Haulian. It's probably Haulian. I'm still going with Paiva on the last name, but I'm probably wrong about that. Um, Kara France had a pretty solid UFC debut uh, when he beat Elias Garcia. His opponent's 18 and 1. Paiva is coming off the contender series. It was a split decision win, though. Um, dude's on a long winning streak, though. Beat Iliar de Santos. I'll go with Cara France, but that's got some potential to it, actually. And in a battle of other guys who. You know, it's also on the should not be in the UFC, we have Teruto Ishihara, who is a grand total of 1-4 and four in his last five. His only win was over Rolando D. He has losses to Artem Lobov, who sucks and is no longer with the UFC, thankfully. Gray Maynard, Jose Alberto Quinones, and then he got knocked stupid by Peter Yan. Ishihara should not be in the UFC. I mean, he just shouldn't. His only wins are over guys who should not be in the UFC, and he's lost to guys who should not be in the UFC. Um, he's fighting Kyung Ho Kong, uh, Mr. Perfect, I believe. And Kong is actually pretty solid. Um, I thought Kong beat Alex Caceres in his debut. He lost to Chico Camus, then he beats... Uh, Shirichi Sinjo, Michinori Tanaka, and Guido Canetti. And I think I thought he won the uh, Hikardo Hamos fight. Uh, Kong's actually good. Ishihara isn't. Kong should win this. Uh, Lando Venata, still in the UFC, despite having a grand total of one win. <laughs> good lord. Lando Venata's UFC record is 1 3 and 2. <laughs> one win, three losses. Two draws. Um, he's fighting Marcos... Marcos Rosa. I believe this is Rosa's... Okay, that's nickname. Yeah, he's Brazilian, so it's Marcos Mariano. Um, right, I'm going to go out on a limb and actually pick Lando Venata to win a fight. Which... Uh, it, which kind of sucks. So, <laughs> did actually make that pick, but uh, I'm going to pick Lando Venata to win a fight. Uh, let's see. I'm oh, sorry, that will be the main event for the Fight Pass prelims. Uh, we will also have Jalen Turner and uh, Callan Porter. Turner's fought in the UFC, I do not believe. Sorry, not, not Porter, Potter. Uh, Turner lost in the UFC? Yeah, I lost to Vicente Luque. He's pretty good. I won't hold that too much against him. And Potter, making his UFC debut. Potter most recently lost to Marcin Held via heel hook, because if you lose to Marcin Held, it's probably via heel hook. I'll go with Potter there, actually. Turner was not all that impressive. I mean, again, he fought a pretty decent guy. but And then kicking everything off, we have Wuligi Boren and Jonathan Martinez. Um... Boren has fought in the UFC at least once. Twice. Yeah. Okay, he lost to Rolando D and then lost to Marlon Vera. Okay, Marlon Vera's... Marlon Vera's a good fighter. Rolando D is not. Uh, by contrast, we have Jonathan Martinez. I believe this is UFC debut. No, he lost to Andre Sukumtot. Okay, again, one of these the loser here should not be in the UFC. Um I'll go with Burin just for the lulls. 
<coughs> so that is UFC 234 next Saturday. I will have coverage in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. So, as usual, please stop by, say hello. I appreciate it. Uh, again, very main event heavy. Uh, if those top two, if one of those top two fights falls out, that whole thing is taking a major hit. If they both do, I don't see how that event holds together. I just don't. There's not enough there to pad that out. Quite frankly, absent those top two fights, I don't think you even have a very good like fight night card. But uh, again, I'm always down for a Whitaker fight, so hopefully everything holds together. All right, and moving on to the news. So, the Nevada State Athletic Commission held their... Oh, God. They had their stuff. I... Okay. I'm going to start... I'm going to take this, like, piece by piece. First of all, they handed down their rulings on the Nurmagomedov and... McGregor brawl pursuant to UFC 232? Yeah, 232. No, sorry, not 232. 229. Don't know why I forgot that. Uh, let's start with Connor. Connor McGregor was fine. Neither Connor nor Khabib were present at the hearing. Uh, they both had some form of legal representation there, but neither was there personally. Connor was fined $50,000 and suspended six months retroactively to the date of the incident. This is about what was expected. I have no issues with this. It's, again, it's about, again, about what was expected. About It's largely in line with how the various athletic commissions around the country have ruled on stuff like this in the past. Fine. Then we get to Khabib. Khabib was suspended for nine months, retroactive to the date of the incident. I'm okay with that, given that Khabib was, in many respects, the inciting party. Con again, Connor was involved, but Khabib was the one who jumped the fence and then jumped on Dylan Dennis. He carries more responsibility for the events. He should bear a greater penalty. I'm okay with that. Uh, they said that he could reduce it if he records a PSA for an anti-bullying campaign, which is just the... Du Look, I, I don't like bullies. I think it's stupid. It's a sign of a... It's a sign of weak character. To just... I, I, the point being... I, sorry again, I don't like it. I'm not trying to stand up for it, but... The notion that will reduce your suspension that affects your livelihood if you participate in an anti-bullying campaign... I don't get it. Like, that's... That doesn't really track for me, necessarily. Especially since Herbie was not exactly a bully in this situation. I mean, he bullied Connor in the cage because they were fighting. But I... I don't know. I mean, this just... To me, this kind of smacks of... We're going to pat ourselves on the back for making someone do something that falls in line with our morals and... St your viewpoint on reality. Not the biggest fan. But they've also handed down rulings like that in the past, so it's not out of line with again, somewhat established precedent. I might think I might not necessarily agree with it or kind of think it's silly, but they weren't pulling this out of their you know, backside. And we get to the fine, and this is where I take issue. Habib was fined $500,000. This is ludicrous. Uh, this is absolutely ludicrous. If you... and I mean, it, it borders on the indefensible. Now, I am aware that the, it, that, that constituted 25% of Khabib's total purse. Uh, Khabib's total purse was $2 million. I don't care that it was a percentage. I, I, I don't care. Unless there is an established, written guideline that fighting with your opponent's corner men costs you 25% of your purse. If that's the established you know, codified rule, then fine. I might still think it's stupid, but you're not pulling it out of your ass. 
They pulled this out of their ass. There is no actual guideline for this. It's whatever they feel like doing. I mean, you can't get this... Uh, for the, like, If you're unaware about like actual criminal activity, do you know how much you have to do to be fined half a million dollars in actual criminal activity? You have to be a white-collar scam artist in the to the tunes of millions of dollars before they will find you like that. It is utterly ridiculous. I mean, if, I mean, look, for a similar example, since these two things are tied together in some respects, when Connor threw that, you know, the, instant, the incident with Connor and Khabib's team in Brooklyn, when he, you know, committed criminal trespass and threw a dolly at a bus and you know, all of that, you know what Conor McGregor's fine by the state of New York for his criminal activity was? The cost to repair the bus. Because in actual litigation, be it criminal or civil, there are established rules, guidelines, precedents. Whereas the Nevada State Athletic Commission, being a bureaucratic mess, gets to do whatever it wants because they are appointed by the governor, they are not elected, they are not answerable to anyone except the governor, and there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to genuinely like sue the state of Nevada. <laughs> Otherwise, they get to do whatever they want because government bureaucracy. Yay. Um, look, I let me be clear. I don't think... Uh, I, I thought, you know, a 50k fine for Connor was fair. If you want to say because... Okay, look. If you believe could be bears more responsibility for this, and I said that I do. Fine, he should be fined more than Connor. Double Connor's fine. Fine Habib, 100k. Might still be a little bit on the egregious side if we look at all things be all things being equal, but it's not ridiculous. Finding him half a million dollars because you feel like it, and really, that's all this is. There is no structure. There is no guideline. There is nothing codified. There is nothing formalized. It's whatever this bunch of morons who are <coughs> who get appointed by the governor because they were friends in high school or slept with him once. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know what you do to get appointed to an athletic commission because apparently competency is not part of the equation. More on that. I'm actually going to get to that in just a minute, slightly more. But competency... Not much of an equation. Your relationship with the governor is everything. This bunch of ass clowns. Uh, again, and again, there is no actual structure. There is no rule. There is no guideline for them to point and say, if you engage in, if you get into a fight af with you know the cornermen after the fight is done, or you know during the fight, if whatever then this costs you X percentage of your purse. That's not actually written down anywhere. It's whatever they feel like, whenever they feel like it. I am not a fan of this setup, generally. I'm not opposed to the, you know, the existence of the Athletic Commission and them having some oversight over MMA or boxing or what have you, because I don't think you can have promoters simply self-regulating and self-referring that opens up the door to entirely too much abuse. I'm complaining about this instance because in this instance, this group of people who's who have a history more akin to that of a clown fiesta than that of a you know professional regulated governmental body needs to be addressed somehow, but there is no mechanism for addressing it. The only way to get removed from the Nevada State Athletic Commission, I looked this up. Not a joke. I looked this up. Is to either step down voluntarily, miss three or four consecutive meetings, so a, his, a, de a demonstrable history of absence, or have the governor remove you. That is it. That is ridiculous. You are dealing at this point with an, with an executive branch bureaucracy, answerable to no one, Realistically, again, one person that has no real established or you know, 
guidelines to it. It's them flying by the seat of their pants. It is a clown fiesta. And I mean, frankly, it just gets... In a lot of respects, it gets worse, but... Um, Khabib, they also handed down one-year suspensions retroactive to the date of incident to two of Khabib's teammates, one of which was Byra Tehugov. I forget the name of the other gentleman. Um, you know, I don't hate that. Let me be clear about that. I don't hate that. Those two guys, among others, further instigated the brawl. Again, Connor played his part. Some of Connor's corner played their part. Uh, Habib and those two are kind of the are the more responsible parties. Again, I when that whole thing happened, I mentioned, you know, again, Habib's at fault because he made the choices. Connor's at fault for being Connor. The UFC's at fault for being the UFC. And I talked about, I, I went into some length about how everyone played a part in contributing to that entire scenario. That said, the decision ultimately rested with Khabib and parts of his corner to do what they did. In that sense, they do bear more responsibility for it. I am okay with them receiving harsher punishments than the other, than, you know, again, Khabib being fined more and suspended longer than Connor, fine. I'm completely okay with that. I'm sign- again, I'm significantly less okay with an arbitrary number that the that the Nevada State Athletic Commission pulls. I mean, for God's sake, they're self-funded. They're basically collecting revenue for the state with stuff like this. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Now, when they collect revenue like this, uh, someone asked them. I believe it was Ariel Hawani asked someone in the. Uh, I might have been Bob Bennett, the executive director but ask them about what happens. Apparently, when they find someone, it does not just stay within the commission. It goes into the state general fund. I believe the Nevada State Athletic Commission does is funded by the state general fund in that particular respect, or they can dip into it. So, I don't like, again, I just, I don't like that. I don't think it looks good that they're basically just, you know, trying to fund themselves by yanking half a million dollars from a guy as an, as an arbitrary number that they decided on based on how they felt that morning, whether or not they had taken enough Pepto-Bismol. Uh, it's, uh, it's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. And again, I would be more okay with it if there was an actual structure in place. But there isn't. It's whatever these bunch of yahoos feel like. They, pres- they, they recommended a lifetime ban for Nick Diaz for marijuana when the testing results were highly in dispute. I don't like Nick Diaz. Not a fan. That's still ridiculous. This is an absolute clown fiesta. Uh, in the aftermath, Habib said he will not be fighting in uh, Nevada again. Frankly, I'm surprised people do. If you're under the auspices of this group of morons, whose ability to find their collective ass with both hands and a flashlight is seriously in dispute, I, I'm i not sure I would feel comfortable fighting there either. Uh, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, that said, we again, we do have a now potential timetable return for Habib, which would be... Uh, if you factor in actual training camp, you're probably looking at early autumn of 2019. Uh, So late summer, so somewhere in September, October is entirely possible. Um, Look, I want to see Tony fight Habib for the title. That's literally all I want out of the sport. Not literally all I want. That is one of the very few things I really want from the sport. I want to see those two fight. I have loved that fight since it was first in that since they first tried to do it years ago. I wanted to see that fight. My desire to see it has only increased as both guys have only gotten better. Uh, sadly, that does not seem to be in the cards. It's just it's. Oh God. Now, if Jeff were here, this is the point where he would say, "Strip Habib, make Tony and Dustin for the inter- for the lightweight title." Which is, again, that is a possibility. I've I've struggled with why I'm so opposed to this because you know Jeff asked me you know what what my deal was with it and it's a fair question, and I didn't want my reaction to just be I don't like it because 
I, I don't think that's a very sound argument in this instance. So I've I've been trying to figure out what is my gripe with this. You know, with, with that, if that if that if that is the series of events that happens, what is my opposition to it? What is my gripe? And I think it comes down to a couple of things. One, a, again, I just want to see Tony and Khabib. I think Khabib has earned the title. I want to see that fight. I'm sick of the tap dancing that is going on in the UFC right now, and the log jamming, and the you know, again, stuff like TJ dropping down to 125 and log jamming a division and threatening another one, and now even after losing, it still throws things into a modicum of chaos because Marlon Moraes just solidified himself as the clear number one contender, but you're still dicking around talking about wanting to fight Cejudo again. It's, it, it, ugh, I hate that mess. Lightweight has been a mess for a long time now. I mean, consider this, just for a moment, consider this. Conor McGregor was the last champion in the U- in the lightweight division to become the champion by beating the champion. If you don't mind, just let's track this for just a minute because this bit of like broken lineage is a big part of why I just think you know what maybe the next nine months are not the best, but let's get some normalcy back. Connor comes up to lightweight, beats Eddie Alvarez to become UFC lightweight champion. Does not defend it, ever. Uh, gets to hold on to it for his fight with Floyd Mayweather because they wanted to promote UFC champion versus boxing champion. During that time, uh, Tony Ferguson becomes interim champion by beating Kevin Lee. Tony Ferguson is then set to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov for what will be the un- the full title. I can't say undisputed because it is in dispute at that point. But for the full title, at which point his interim title will be promoted slash retired. Again, the specifics of how they wanted to do that can vary, but whatever. Winner of that fight will be champion. Tony blows out his knee a week out because he lives the gimmick of Ray-Bans 24-7. Dude probably sleeps with them on. Bear in mind, I love Tony as a fighter, and dude's crazy in the best way possible. But blows out his knee. Khabib gets a lawn, uh, like a, a carousel of opponents. Finally, it's Al Iaquinta. Khabib wins, wins the title by beating Iaquinta, who was barely in the top 15 at the time. <laughs> so we now have the champion, who did not beat either the previous champion or the interim champion, but beat a, la- a literal last day replacement to become champion. Khabib then defends his title and unifies the lineal title by beating Conor McGregor. And we finally have, again, a sense, like a potential sense of normalcy and continuity. Yay. This is a good thing. And then Khabib kind of throws it away by jumping on Dylan Dennis. And much as Dylan Dennis is a waste of space as a human being, I don't think you should give him the acknowledgement that he exists by you know, trying to fight him. But he does. And we now wind up in this current situation. Now, if the UFC strips Khabib and just puts the vacant title on the line for Tony versus Dustin Poirier, for example, who are, I think, the next two guys in line, deservingly so, whoever wins that fight has now become, again, the next guy to win a title in that division, not from the previous champion. And I'm just kind of sick of that, to be perfectly honest with you. And realistically, what happen, What would happen, in theory, so let's say Tony wins, I would pick him to win. Let's say Tony wins, becomes champion, then fights Khabib. And we're just, again, we're just dancing in circles here, and I'm, I'm just a little bit I mean, again, middleweight had this just a couple of years ago. 
when Michael Bisbing wouldn't fight a deserving contender in favor of a vanity project against Dan Henderson that didn't even sell all that well, and then losing to George St. Pierre. While, meanwhile, Robert Whitaker beat the two best middleweights in the world and had to get promoted to full champion after interim status when George St. Pierre relinquished the title. And again, I, pra- I actually praise GSP for doing that quickly rather than drawing things out. Fine. But, oh God. And then the whole lightweight, light heavyweight thing where you had John stripped of the belt and then DC becomes champion but isn't real, but, you know, we all know isn't the best light heavyweight. John comes back, beats, and wins. Didn't he win an interim title when he beat OSP? Beats, and then gets stripped of that. Beats DC, gets stripped of that. DC w- is reinstated. Moves up to heavyweight. Jo- like, Have we not had enough of this crap? And don't get me wrong. This situation right now sucks. I am not a fan of it. I really am not. But I'm genuinely kind of wondering what the massive harm would be if... And bear in mind, I don't know Tony's financial situation, so if Tony needs to fight for you know money and whatnot, I, 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 again, there's a lot of factors I don't know. But to the fan, to the fan base, generally speaking, is there anything really lost by ensuring the continuity of the title in the sense that we just wait. If we wait for Khabib's title suspension to be up, wait for the training camps, and they fight somewhere outside of Nevada, and I I don't care about the location, say New York, why not? If we just, you know, if we wind up just waiting that six to nine months, which again, I'm not, not necessarily my favorite thing, I'm not hugely in favor of this, but let's say we, but is it the worst if we just ensure that the current finally undisputed champion fights the undisputed number one contender, in my estimation, Tony Ferguson, fights the number one contender so that the next champion can actually beat the previous champion to become the champion? I just... I'm not sure what the massive disservice is that's being done. I want Tony to fight for the belt. I think he deserves it. I want him to fight the actual champion, though. I don't want him to fight for a vacant belt. I don't want Poirier to fight for a vacant belt. I've frankly had it up to, you know, my metaphorical eyes with this, again, the the broken lineage and the jumping around, and I'm just sick to death of it. And... I am prepared to do that, consequently just wait. I would rather, me, as a fan, if you feel differently, fine. I just, I was forced, and I mean that in a good way, to look at my position and figure out what my issues with this were. I have reached a point, personally, where I would rather wait six to nine months so we genuinely get Tony versus Khabib, which will fall through anyway because we're cursed. That's much more what I am interested in than we than us breaking the you know the lineage again for the sake of expediency so the UFC can have another title fight on top of a pay-per-view. And bear in mind, Poirier versus Ferguson is a tremendous fight with a lot of potential for violence between two of the three best lightweights in the world, two of the four, two of the top four best in the world. Love that fight. I have no issues with that fight. But the guys at the you know the championship, the guys at the top, in multiple divisions over the last three to five years, have either been dicked around or done or just you know, screwed around themselves. And I've had it with that. I would rather wait for Tony versus Khabib to be Tony versus Khabib, Khabib undefeated, undisputed, UFC lightweight champion of the world against Tony Ferguson than jack everything around again. I've just had it with that. And again, to be clear, that's just me. If you out there feel differently, fine. And some of this might have to do with the amount of the sport I consume. If 
you know, you're one of those people who doesn't care about what takes place at flyweight or bantamweight. So you're not, so your saturation point for all of this nonsense does not include the TJ Cejudo crap. Maybe you have a different tolerance than I do. Maybe you know, how much you consume and the style in which you consume it, even if your tolerance is identical to mine, you're taking in less, so it's less of a thing. Fine. I am, I am not at all here to say that my perspective on this is the best or the only one. I don't think either of those things is true. But that's why I'm at where I'm at. And... I am okay with being... I am okay with where I am and how I got here. I mean, I, I appreciated the exercise of having to look at it and figure out why I'm why I am where I am. And... That's how I got here. Again, if you disagree, if you're somewhere else entirely, fine. There's a lot of ways to think about this and to feel about this situation. And I don't think any of them are necessarily wrong. I'm sure there's people out there who are holding completely unra- you know, irrational points, but for the most part, I'm okay with again, I'm okay with being where I am and how I got here. So that's what I would like to see going forward. Um, you know, I don't care what Connor does. Um, again, Con- I-, I would like Connor and Cowboy. I really would. But beyond that, Connor is kind of what he is. And so there was that. Uh, other things that came out of the Nevada State Athletic Commission hearing, I'm just going to lump all of these into the hearing results. Uh, John Jones was granted a one-fight license for the fight with Anthony Smith. His bout with Smith will officially serve as the main event for UFC 235. Yeah, 235, uh, March 2nd. That event also has Woodley versus Usman and Lawler versus Askren. You know, that's a really good main card. It's only four fights, but Jones, Smith, Woodley, Usman, Lawler, Askren, and even Garbrandt Munoz. Uh, that's a really solid card, actually, for pay-per-view. Uh, Jones will be subject to further testing, but it seems like, you know, uh, I think it was Vada who released another history of Jones's drug tests, or there was some that were released over the last week, that showed, again, if the, you know, pulsing theory, hypothesis that's been put forward... Uh, is correct. This does seem to bear that out, given the times that, I mean, John tested positive, literally tested positive for this metabolite one day and negative the next. And if someone has perfected Jones's microdosing, so to speak, to the point where all that's detectable is picograms, which is actually a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than micro, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to say about that because if you've reached that level of scientific sophistication, Godspeed, man. Uh, again, I don't know that you know, what they have posited is what's actually happening. I know that's what's actually happening is in line with what they've posited. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other explanations. But given that everything is seeming to line up under these under this theory, and now that there's a little bit of data, I think it might rise to the level of theory, but given given the line that's been said, I think as long as what Jones goes through falls in line with that, he's going through extra testing and whatnot, then, you know, I can kind of live with it. Um, at this point, by and large, I feel, unless we get definitive scientific evidence to, to, what, to the contrary, where you are as an individual with John is where you are as an individual with John. Um... And I'm, there's nothing I can say that will convince you otherwise, necessarily. But he is licensed for his one... He has a one-fight license. Uh, how things play out, how his testing results play out and whatnot over the course of this fight will probably determine going forward. But that fight's on. Good. Get that division back to normal. We need a little bit of normalcy. This sport has entirely too much chaos. And I love chaos. I love watching the world burn. In a lot of respects, but... Uh, there's, there is a finite amount of that that I can, you know, 
there is a limit to how much I want to watch the world burn. And I certainly don't want to set it on fire. But if it's burning, eh, I'll roast some marshmallows. Um, oh yeah, the last thing, and this relates to Khabib and Connor, uh, f- that came out of this hearing. Bob Bennett, the executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, further cemented that he is a moron. He said, coming out of this, uh, during this hearing, that, and this relates to Connor, that the, uh, the pre-fight talk from Connor McGregor was, I forget exactly how he phrased it, Um, But there were a couple of points that he raised. Like, it was not only unacceptable, but that the level that it rose to was different, was, you know, above other levels that he'd seen in other sports. He he implied, and I think might have outright stated, that the problem of pre-fight trash talk to this degree is unique to MMA, that Connors rose to a different level, and that the Nevada State Athletic Commission should probably look into what they can do to curtail it and censor it. Okay, moron. Let's take this point by point, shall we? Um, let's start with some of the stuff that, you know, that Connor's trash talk and whatnot rose to a different level. I do not believe this is accurate. Don't get me wrong. I don't like Connor's trash talk. I really don't. In fact, I mentioned how I thought what he said and how he said it contributed to that whole situation. But... If we're going to let's just, you know, let's focus on within the sphere of MMA and what has been said and whether or not Connor falls out of line with that necessarily. Uh, does no one else remember Chael Sonnen saying that Brazilians were primitives who played in the mud and worshipped uh, mud idols? Because I do, literally things that Chael Sonnen said. Um, what a, she had one other, uh, do we not remember, uh, uh, Colby, God, Colby, and some of the laundry list of things that he said that, you know, offended Brazilians, and there was some other group that he bashed on not too long ago, I forget which one, so, um, oh, God, Tito, back in the day, are we just gonna forget all the stupid things Tito said? I mean, what did Khabib, what, what did Connor say in this instance that necessarily falls out of line with the proud history of bad trash talk that exists in MMA? Because the reality is it didn't. This was not... Connor is more is a more public figure doing it, but I... I mean, Frank Mir said he literally wanted to kill someone. Frank Mir said he wanted to be the first person in the UFC to kill someone in the cage, and he wanted to kill Brock Lesnar. And we're going to say that, you know, what Conor said rose above the, like, the stupidity that has been said in MMA before? Oh, God, Marcus Davis said some things about uh, Dan Hardy that were pretty egregious, that were, uh, egregious might be as, He's, look up some of the stuff he said, if you don't believe me. Uh, what Connor says, don't get me wrong, I'm not in favor of it, but let's not pretend that other people in the sport haven't said things as bad, if not worse. Now let's, ad- okay, so there's that. So you're wrong there, moron. Point two, that the level of trash talk in MMA goes above other sports. You're an idiot. Did you? Uh, I mean, were you just unaware of the of the things that were said by Adrian Broner literally days before your pre- before this hearing? At the press conference for his fight with Manny Pacquiao, Adrian Broner said horrible things about Manny, and I believe he actually said that you know Filipinos are all terrible, are all like dirt people who eat dogs. Look, Adrian Broner is an embarrassment to the human race. Don't get me. Uh, uh, I mean, he then proceeded to embarrass himself in the actual fight by being Adrian Broner. But, I mean, that happened literally a week prior to your press con. You're hearing about this, give or take. I mean, literal days. And you think that this that that somehow falls outside, like what Connor said, rises above even that? Why? Uh, because it. 
doesn't by any objective metric. How about, you know, let's go back a little bit further to the great Mike Tyson. Y'all remember some of the stuff Mike Tyson said at press conferences? Because I do. I mean, he threatened to eat people's children. He was probably high enough on coke to have done it. I believe at one point he also said, I'm going to screw you until you love me. Replacing screw with the F word. And suddenly, what, this just doesn't happen because you want to single out Connor and MMA? Let's not at all pretend that there have not been, you know, that boxing doesn't have this grand... Boxing has a long tradition of horrible things being said. I mean, not, not to too much play into the, you know, applying current morals to past situations, but... Did you, are you people unaware of some of the things that were said <laughs> about uh, Jack Johnson leading up to the Jim Jeffries fight? Or just Jack Johnson generally during his title reign? Uh, I mean, you know, dare I bring up Muhammad Ali and some of the stuff he said? <laughs> but no, no, no. Please, Bob Bennett, like, just demonstrate the fact that you have forgotten everything that happened prior to 6 a.m. this morning when you neglected to have your daily bowel movement and just ignored all of the stupid, offensive, horrible things that have been said in other sports that you do oversee. I'm not going to hold you accountable for crap that happens you know, in a sport that falls outside the purview of the boxing, of you know, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Y'all sanction boxing. And you want to pretend that, you know, what Connor said, that what goes on in MMA is somehow worse than what goes on in boxing. You're a moron. Which, of course, brings us to, finally, the third point, that you wish to look into censorship of speech. Moron. You are a government employee for a governmental body. You get to do jack shit about speech. Just fundamentally... You're the govern. You represent the government. The government does nothing about speech. It happens to be the first amendment to the to our national constitution. But given your inability to actually process math, your inability to understand basic civics is not at all surprising. Look, if you want to talk with the UFC, the UFC is a private enterprise. Private enterprise is a world of difference from government. For And I know there's a bunch of people who don't get this generally. The government gets zero say in speech or censorship. The UFC is not the government. The UFC is a private enterprise. If the Nevada State Athletic Commission wanted to talk behind closed doors with the UFC, and the UFC wanted to institute some kind of policy, which, oh, hey, they have, they just ignore because they'd rather drive business I mean, look, you can, t- you can ask the UFC to implement a policy. They won't do it. They have one. They have their loosely knit-together code of conduct that they don't actually enforce because it turns out the marketplace responds to bad trash talk. Who'd have thought? But you don't get to because you're the government. As a government institution, you get to do nothing about what people say. Congratulations. Again, if the UFC wants to actually implement a code of conduct or whatnot, that's on them. Like, I mean, wherever you work probably has a, has a code of conduct and something that actually does reference what you can and can't say in the workplace, which is fine. It's a private business. A, bus- a private enterprise gets to do that. The government doesn't. That's how it works. Bob Bennett, I know you're confused about things, such as your actual job, but... You are a government bureaucrat. Given that you work for the government, you get to do nothing about this. Sit down, shut up, eat your pudding, vote for Bernie Sanders, whatever you do, you moron. Sorry, I shouldn't have thrown the Bernie Sanders thing in there. I don't want to get overly political because government bureaucracies are a pain in the... are like a blight on society regardless of political affiliation. So my apologies, didn't mean to throw Bernie Sanders in there. Just opened a door I don't want to go down. Bob Bennett being a moron, I think is fairly well established at this point. So that was the latest clown fiesta coming out of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. 
again, I don't know. Like, I, I'm genuinely curious, like, what, whether or not fighters feel comfortable competing under the auspices of that group of people. It just doesn't make sense to me. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't necessarily have to make sense to me. They're the ones who have to live with it. And if they can, and if the fighters can live with a lot of it, then fair play. It is not going to stop me from calling those people morons when they continue to do crap like this. All right. Again, that was our major news point. Um, the other, I think, the only other thing I really wanted to touch on was a fight change that we had. Um, it got mentioned, I think, last week that uh, Holly, excuse me, Holly Holm was supposed to fight uh, Aspen, Aspen Ladd, I think it was, and that that fight got pulled. Um, Holly mentioned there were some negotiations going on. It might be her overall contract. Uh, there are stories coming about now that the UFC wants Holm versus Amanda Nunes to main event 237. Uh, UFC 237 from Curitiba, Brazil. Um, if that fight... Well, two things about this very briefly. A, if that fight happens, not a given, but if it does, and if Amanda Nunes wins, which I would favor her to do, Amanda Nunes will have beaten every previous UFC women's featherweight or bantamweight champion and will have beaten their current flyweight champion twice. That is a hell of a resume. (laughs) Again, if the fight actually happens. Um, Nunes mentioned briefly that after she beat Cyborg, apparently someone in her family, I want to say her mother, kind of encouraged her to retire. Because what else are you going to do? If she beats Holly Holm, again, the only previous champion she hasn't beaten because she beat Misha, she beat Ronda, she beat Jermaine, she beat Cyborg. She beat Shevchenko twice. Much as I disagree with the scoring in the second one, officially she... I mean, she won the first fight fair and square, so she would have had a win over her anyway. The only champion at 125... Ah, she hadn't beaten Nico Montano, but... But the only bantamweight champion previous that she hasn't beaten is Holly. And in fairness, Holly, I thought, should have won the fight with Jermaine Durandamy. So she would have been a, a potential featherweight champion as well. I mean, if that happens, I... I mean, what more could Amanda do? There's not exactly a long list of bantamweight challengers for her. I think she actually mentioned that if she were to beat Holly, she might just retire after the fight. And you know what? I mean, Amanda's already the best female MMA fighter ever. Definitely currently. And her resume is such that I don't have a problem calling her the best MMA, the best female MMA fighter ever. And there have been some good ones, and I think Amanda's the best. If she beats Holly, and again, I would favor her to do so, I... Uh, I mean, there's there's literally nothing else for her. She might just retire. And she's intimated as such. And, you know, again, I think that's probably the best bantamweight fight you could make for her at the moment is Holly. I mean, she's beaten the other top contenders already. Uh, for the rankings here, let me see. Because right now, at bantamweight number... Why is Jermaine Durandamy number one? Anyway, Amanda finished her previously, though the rematch wouldn't be bad. You have Holly, uh, Ketlin Vieja, who's, I just, she's ranked, but I, she's highly ranked, but I don't think she's ready for a title shot. Raquel Pennington, who Nunes beat. Zingano, who is on a losing streak and, like, uh, just moved up to featherweight a little bit anyway. Marion Renault. it just gets, uh, then you have Aspen Ladd, who's rising, but after that, it just, no. Like, she's either beaten all of these women already, or... God, those rankings are so screwed up at at women's bantamweight. That's so weird. Did they just, like, mash up a bunch... Oh, God, that is such a bizarre division right now, generally. 
Uh, but again, there's there's not a whole lot left for her to do. <laughs> Um, maybe between now and then we, get, you know, Ketlin Vieja really establishes herself. Uh, that would be nice. Again, Vieja's good. Uh, I just, but apart from that, you're not dealing with a whole lot that Nunes hasn't either already beaten or <laughs> it's just too green. So uh, there is that. Um, and again, if she does retire, I think she's the goat. I think she's the best. And Maybe not forever, but you cannot argue with her resume, man. That is a stacked resume of accomplishment that Amanda Nunes has put together. That is absolutely absurd. All right. I do believe that's everything. Let me do one last... Two things. First, I'm going to refresh Twitter, because... Random stuff happens on Twitter all the time. <laughs> uh, it does not look like anything broke over the last couple of seconds. Um, no, I'm not going to address some of the rumors around Connor because they are still just rumors. Uh, there's no actual evidence at the moment supporting any of it, and I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna go around. I'm not gonna touch some of that stuff just yet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Nunez eyeing retirement, which we talked about. Highlights. I think we have covered everything. Uh, I suppose I could... No, no, I don't acknowledge Bellator, so I'm not going to talk about that. Because yeah, Bellator is terrible. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, let's see, what do I have this week? There is no damn you Hollywood. But there is, I believe, a TV party that will be the final season of the Netflix series Voltron, the Legendary Defender, that Mark and I will be participating in. Uh, we've done every season so far, and now we get to the last one, which I thought, quite frankly, was the weakest. Um, I was I was disappointed in a lot of the last season. Don't get me wrong, there's some good points. But... Uh, given how high I was on the series kind of generally going into the final season, uh, not impressed. So, Mark and I will break down all the, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, what we thought of it this season. We'll probably do a little bit of, uh, you know, the series generally, so be on the lookout for that on Tuesday. Um, Fridays, for the foreseeable future, I will be, I've been doing, uh, Impact Wrestling coverage in the Wrestling Zone of 411 Mania. Because someone has to. And my Fridays were clear. So if you want to come by and laugh at how bad I am at that, uh, it, it's pretty comical. So, But for those of you who are into you know professional wrestling, you can find me covering Impact Wrestling Fridays. Jeez, they start at like 10 Eastern. They're like 10 to midnight now. Because they're 8 to 10 here. Um, oh, God, that was the last thing I wanted to briefly touch on. Sorry. Um, no, you know what? I'll save it, because um, I want to actually talk about it with someone else rather than just talk to myself. So I will put a pin in uh, the pacing for next week. And so, yeah, that'll be me for the week. Next week, we'll be back here. Uh, we will have a review of UFC 234 and a preview of UFC on ESPN 1. Their debut with a main card on ESPN. Uh, they're bringing Cain Velasquez versus Francis Ngannou, and this is an this is just an oddly constructed card. <laughs> um, 
the main event's solid. The co-main is really good. Uh, James Vick versus Paul Felder has some potential. After that, things get weird. You have Courtney Casey and Cynthia Calvillo. You have Alex Caceres and Cron Gracie, Vicente Luque. It's, I don't know, man. <coughs> this does not feel like a very great card. They're banking pretty heavily on Velasquez versus Nganu. And, uh, and this, that's Kane's first fight in a long time. His last fight was what, Travis Brown at 200? Yeah. <coughs> God, that's almost three years. Not almost, might be a bit of a stretch, but that's two and a half. That's a long time to be out, man. A long time. Anyway, next week we'll have a full preview of that event, such as it is, and such as it will be by the time we get there, because things happen. And Jeff will be back next week. We should have everything back to working smoothly next week, so I thank you very much for your patience while you've had to deal with just me the last couple of times. Until then, thanks for listening. Stay safe out there, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave. <laughs>